Good morning, guys. This is Bathrobe Business. I'm George Yoganov, and today we're not going to be talking about business per se. We're going to be talking about the Great Salt Lake. Satellite images show the lake drying up fast. At the bottom of the Great Salt Lake is a bunch of arsenic, and if it goes dry, that just starts getting blown by winds into, like, it becomes like that entire area is going to be essentially inhabitable without guaranteed cancer. Booming environmental nuclear bomb in Utah. Now, the Great Salt Lake has become a popular subject in media across country because apparently the lake is drying up because of evil corporations and it's got all this poison at the bottom that is going to wipe out the entire West Coast. Vice was quoted as saying, this is a nuclear bomb. Now, I want to frame something for you before we begin. I am not against conservation. I am not a global warming denier. I am not an anti-environmentalist. What I am is anti-panic. In the last three years, I saw the world shut down over a panic. And this isn't the first time, and it's not gonna be the last time. The only way we can make logical, rational decisions is by looking at the data, not panicking, and taking incremental steps. So, again, I am not against conservation. I am not getting paid by the corporations what evil corporations, I don't know. This isn't an episode of Captain Planet where some evil corporate magnet is just diverting water for the sake of evil. I don't know. I'm just going to be giving you the facts that I have discovered to kind of have a balanced argument so that you can look at this logically. Now, let's begin our journey at the very beginning. So, about 14 to 15,000 years ago, the Great Salt Lake was not yet the Great Salt Lake. It was actually a much larger lake called Lake Bonneville. Now, this is during the Ice Age, and it's during a time of different weather patterns and even different tectonic shifting plates. So it is not surprising that this lake existed at the time. As weather changed, as tectonic plates shifted, and as currents changed, the lake began to dry up and became what is known as the Great Salt Lake today. However, the story does not end there. The Great Salt Lake has had issues with water levels for over a century. For those of you that live in Utah, you've probably heard of the Great Salt Air. It is a concert hall out on the outskirts of Salt Lake County that is sitting primarily off of the lake. However, this is not the first iteration of the Great Salt Lair. It is actually the third iteration. The original Great Salt Air was actually a Coney Island style theme park. Very similar to Coney Island in New York, it was considered the Coney Island of the West. It had fairs, roller coasters, amusement parks, and a dock that stretched out onto the lake. This is an article from the Salt Lake Tribune that talks about one of the reasons that the Great Salt Air closed down. The primary reason was a fire, but the main reason why the Salt Air wasn't rebuilt was because of receding water levels. This is going back to the late 19th and early 20th century. Now, a lot of the articles that you're going to find are going to talk about how agriculture is one of the main components of why the lake is drying up. That's one of the main issues that the Vice article quoted. However, agriculture in Utah has been declining, and that's rational as we move from an agrarian state to a more tech-based and service-based state. We have the Silicon Slopes here. So in front of you, you have a table from the Bureau of Land Management and Labor Statistics that show how much farmland was being used over the decades. In 1959, about 52,000, I'm sorry, 52 million acres were being used for farmland. Currently, according to a 2017 study, only 10.8 million acres are being used for farmland. Keep in mind that in 1959, they did not have as sophisticated irrigation systems as we do now. Nowadays, farmers will monitor soil moisture and they will look for oncoming weather patterns in order to adapt their watering patterns. So we're using less water in agriculture today than we were 50 to 60 years ago. Now, some of the other studies will point to a company called U.S. Magnesium. U.S. Magnesium is the largest magnesium production company in the United States. They distribute magnesium across the United States for medical purposes, and everything from vitamins 
to industrial purposes, everything to metallurgy, to iPhones. Now, it is true that U.S. magnesium siphons off water from the Great Salt Lake. And it is true that most of that water is lost to, evapor is, is lost to evaporation. How this is done is essentially water is drained from the Salt Lake into evaporation pools. As the water is fully evaporated, they scoop up all the minerals, refine them, and distribute them. However, this actually pales in comparison to the amount of water usage that is happening in cities. So in 2021, U.S. magnesium diverted approximately 41,457 acres from the Great Salt Lake. During that same period of time, 69,000 acre feet of water was diverted by the Salt Lake City. Ogden diverted approximately 27,000, I'm sorry, 27,000 residents diverted approximately 14,000 acres of water. And Provo diverted around 24,000 acre feet of water for a total of 107,000 acre feet of water diverted from the lake by the city's inhabitants. And that's what leads me to the point of this video. I love that Salt Lake City is growing. I love that Utah is growing. But we, with that growth comes sacrifice, and that sacrifice is water usage. The main reason the lake is shrinking, and the main reason the lake has been shrinking for the last 100 plus years is because of a growing population. The city of Salt Lake, Ogden, Provo, and the state of Utah is growing. And as we grow, those people consume water. There is a price to pay for culture and diversity, and this is it. Every person that takes a shower, mows their lawn, has a drink of water, or flushes a toilet is contributing to water loss from the Great Salt Lake. So it's easy to point fingers at other companies and other people, but really we are the culprits. Now, there is a slight silver lining. The state is working to reverse a lot of it. They are trying to divert as much water from outside reservoirs that's unnecessary into the Great Salt Lake to save it. Furthermore, we have had a record-breaking winter. This winter is going to lead to higher water levels at every single reservoir, river, and lake in the state of Utah. Now, a lot of people are also concerned about the mineral deposits at the bottom of the Great Salt Lake. A lot of them will use Owens Lake in California as an example of what can go wrong when a lake dries up. And Owens Lake was an ecological disaster. However, it is not the same circumstance. For those of you that don't know, in the uh, early 1900s, so in the early 20th century, Los Angeles needed water. So they essentially went up north and diverted an entire lake into Los Angeles in order to supply the city's inhabitants with running drinking water. The problem was the lake dried up at the bottom was arsenic because arsenic is a natural occurring element and it was deposited at the bottom of the lake for infinite amount of time, essentially since the lake was formed. And as the winds picked up, it created dust clouds, which suffocated its residents, quote unquote, not to be that dramatic, but it did chase out people from the area because the soil concentration of arsenic became too toxic. This is a problem. However, Unfortunately, in Utah, our ambient arsenic levels are actually incredibly high as is. So according to a recent study, ambient ar arsenic soil concentration is 17 times higher than the EPA standard of 0 0.68 parts per million. I'm not saying this is a good thing. All I'm saying is the fact that the lake has an arsenic concentration of approximately 1.5 parts per million is not going to be as much of an increase from what the residents are experiencing now. Again, everything is relative. I'm not happy that we have arsenic in the soils, but before we start panicking, let's consider that we're already being exposed to much more arsenic than we are normally. And if the lake does dry up, it will only mean a small incremental increase in arsenic. Again, not a good thing, but just something to consider in the frame. We are not looking at an ecological disaster where we will be choked by arsenic because we're going from zero to 100. It's more like we're at 60 and we're going to go to 65. Now, the other nice thing of why Owens Lake is very different than the Great Salt Lake is wind patterns. So wind patterns at Owen, Owens Lake is very different. They have sea breezes coming in and hitting the Sierra Nevadas, creating powerful gusts. We don't have that problem here in Utah. So according to a study published by the University of Utah, which is literally titled, 
results of the Great Salt Lake dust bloom study, it was found that the Great Salt Lake actually only has 44 days of strong winds per year. And that is a mixture of downslope winds and outflow winds. So direct wind into the city at high gusts will actually be much lower than we estimate. So even if the lake was to go from where it is now to completely dry, which it won't, not anytime soon, and even if the arsenic concentration is there at what we estimate it to be, it won't necessarily make it entirely into the city because of the wind flow patterns of the area. That's essentially all I was trying to say with this video. I'm not making an argument against conservation. I'm not making an argument for being horrible with your resources. I'm just trying to frame the fact that not everything is a panic and should not be panic driven. You have to weigh the pros and cons. You have to look at what's going on and you have to make a rational decision. I hope you guys can see what I was trying to accomplish with this video and be able to take this data and make a rational decision. That's it. That's the video. Uh, I will be back with my normal format tomorrow morning. I hope you have a great day. Take care.